Hello, welcome back to my channel. And welcome to my October wrap up. Once again, excited to be making this video. I feel like I say that in every one of my videos, but it is the truth. I'm always excited to be making videos for you. Today, I'm excited to talk about the books I read in October. This was my second most productive reading month of the year. I have been kind of keeping track of the amount of books that I've been reading off of my physical TBR. And as a result, I've also been kind of looking at just overall reading numbers for myself for this calendar year. And while this month didn't even get close to rivaling July, where I read over 50 books, I did read about 28 books, which I'm really, really pleased with. And I feel like it's leading me well into the, I was going to say latter half of the year, leading me well into the last two months of the year, which is good because I have a lot of reading I need to get done for you. I have a lot of fun and exciting content planned for November and December specifically. I feel like October is getting me hyped for that because I've been reading some pretty good stuff, bad stuff as well, but also some really good stuff. So I think today I'm going to be talking to you about 11 of those 28 books. I never talk about all of the books that I've read in a given month in my wrap ups. If you're new to my channel, I tend to only talk about the ones that I have not exhaustively talked about in other videos. Usually if I've talked about a book kind of here and there in a weekly reading vlog, I'll talk about it here as well. But if I've done a specific like secret TBR video or like dedicated reading vlog, I'm not going to kind of repeat that same information in my wrap ups. I just think it's like kind of unexciting. And you can go watch those videos if you want more information on some books that I really, really loved. I had a pretty good time this month, especially with KU Romance. I feel like that's like pretty standard for me, but um, sometimes KU can be hit or miss. And I feel like this month, like there really were not a lot of misses, which is awesome. I did have some other stuff that I read this month. So let's talk about those books. So the first book we're going to talk about is one of the only DNFs that I had this month, and it is It Ain't Me Babe by Tilly Cole. This one I read for my reading your like top 10 dark romances video. I was talking about like the top 10 dark romances of all time. And when I do those videos, I like to have read all of the books or attempted to read all of the books. And It Ain't Me Babe was one that was highly recommended. And apparently a lot of people really enjoy. It is a motorcycle club romance slash escaped cult member romance. The heroine of the story is a member of a cult. She escapes and and is helped by a guy who she like randomly had contact with many years ago. He like saw her through the fence of the compound and he's thought about her ever since. For some reason she like ends up on his doorstep because I guess the, the motorcycle club is pretty close by to the compound. And so they enter into a romantic relationship I guess. I think the reason this one didn't work for me was not because of the type of story it is. I love a good motorcycle club romance and I liked the idea of having like this cult aspect to it as well. I think in general having like taboo just different life circumstances of characters tends to actually draw me into a story because I read a lot of the same shit over and over again, right? Like I read a lot of a lot of romance and, and this seemed to be a little bit different, but I just didn't connect with the hero and heroine. And I think part of it was that the hero, I understand motorcycle clubs have different ways of speaking, sure, but the way that he referred to every woman is a bitch. These bitches over here, I don't totally love that personally. I also just didn't get the feeling that he was a particularly like great guy is like stringing this one woman along, even though he still has a thing for the heroine. He's like, oh, like, you know, she's dealing with her own trauma. I'm just going to fuck this other woman instead. And I was just like, not totally vibing that because he's using the woman that he is sleeping with and he ultimately like wants to be with the heroine. And then the heroine, I feel like didn't get to go on enough of a healing journey before she hopped into bed with the hero. It just like wasn't, it was not great. I think if you're like willing to suspend your disbelief, and or you're just looking for this kind of story, I guess, like the whole idea of a cult and a motorcycle club like that, that is what you're looking for. Okay, sure, this could work for you. But I think on a fundamental level as a romance, it sort of missed the mark, which was a bummer because, you know, I want to be able to recommend like the best romances in a particular category. I think the dark romance video that I did specifically, like there were just a lot of romances that didn't work for me, which isn't to say that they're bad necessarily, but um, I feel like that was one that I disagreed with more than others. And that makes sense because dark romance is not like my favorite category of romance anyway, but anyway, anyway, moving on. I think had I finished it, it probably would have been like a two star. Moving on, um, a book that was two stars. Okay, actually I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking at my uh, notes that I have, which are very minimal. I don't take very many notes for these wrap ups anymore, but the next few books are going to be two star reads. That being said, the last book that we're going to talk about is a five star. I do guarantee that I had a five star on this list. And there's also like other books that I really enjoyed, but um, it kind of looks like we're going in order of what I liked and didn't like. So like worst to best books. Something Fabulous by Alexis Hall. I talked about it a little bit in the video where I read 36 of the like most highly anticipated romances for 2022. But I think unfortunately my reading this year has been unkind to my opinion of Alexis Hall and his stories. I really enjoyed A Lady for a Duke. I thought the story was fantastic. And I did like Boyfriend Material. Uh, was it last year, the year before, whenever it came out? Um, I enjoyed that story. I thought it was good. But unfortunately Husband Material and this story really, really missed the mark. So Something Fabulous is a historical 
historical romance and I was like oh cool this will be great this is going to be similar to A Lady for a Duke it was not it was not that this one kind of touts itself as a romp and unfortunately I feel like it was just too mean-spirited to kind of work as a humorous romance. We have our main character Valentine who ends up proposing to this woman named Bella and Bella doesn't want to get married to him and so she kind of just runs off and Valentine being the good guy that he is knows that it's not good for women back in the day to like go out on their own you know like bad things could happen could ruin her reputation so he decides to go and follow her and he ends up taking Bella's brother Bonnie with him so Valentine and Bonnie are going to find Bella and obviously Valentine ends up falling for Bonnie instead of Bella and that would have been fine and dandy if any of the characters were likable. Valentine, I feel like, just got the short end of the stick time and time again, which was frustrating to read about because he didn't really have a ton of flaws, like maybe a little bit too buttoned up and a little bit too uptight, but he was just a nice guy, like trying to do right by the people around him and also right by his father who wanted him to propose to Bella in the first place. Bonnie and Bella were just fucking terrible to him. He ends up getting shot at, he ends up getting kind of kidnapped, and it's all because of the people that he is in contact with and like friends with. And it's just a shame because I think this could have been a really fun story if he was like in on some of the jokes, but he just never was. He just kept getting shit on time and again, and I was like, this is not an enjoyable romance. Like, I can't in good conscience root for Valentine and Bonnie to get together. And Bonnie, like, has sex with other people while they're on their adventure together, and we have Valentine, like, walk in on it. I don't know. I don't consider myself a particularly, like, conservative individual or, like, you know, there can never be cheating in stories. I mean, I guess they weren't together when this incident happened, but, like, I just personally don't want to read sex scenes that are not between the hero and heroine. Like, that doesn't really uh, jazz my jollies, personally. So, overall, this was just not a winner for me. I gave it two stars, and I just, I think I'm going to be hesitant with with what I pick up from Alexis Hall in the future. Definitely looking at reviews of his stuff before I pick up his books. This one, after I read the book, I went on Goodreads and the reviews were fucking terrible, so I wouldn't have probably picked this up on my own accord. Granted, I read it for that video, but in general, I think I'm gonna just like take a step back. Moving on to a romance. So, okay. So I read this one for my monthly book club for the month of September. And because of some stuff that happened in September, I didn't get around to reading until October. But Royally Not Ready by Megan Quinn was a contemporary romance about a girl who finds out that she is actually the heir to the throne of a really small like Scandinavian country. It's her romance between like the advisor to the king and herself. He is the one that's like training her and getting her to be someone who could, you know, potentially be an heir. She owned her own bikini bus, whatever the fuck that means, in Florida before she ends up getting scooped up by Keller, the advisor to the king, and taken to um, her, I guess, home country. And so she's, you know, a little bit rough around the edges, shall we say. And I don't love how Megan Quinn played that up. I love the idea of having like a fish out of water situation. I feel like she was just kind of disrespectful to Keller and kind of the customs of the country. It's not that she like shit on the customs necessarily, but she made it sound like everything was a personal offense, even though she decided that she was going to come to this foreign country and like learn about it. She was given an option, that's the thing. It wasn't like she was kidnapped or anything and like taken against her will. She was asked, hey, do you have any interest in this? Do you want to come here and learn some things? And she was like, yeah, sure. And then she got there and she was a bitch the entire time. Also made some like, I don't want to say weird sexual innuendos to our hero, but he was trying to be very professional at the start of the story and she kept coming on to him and he didn't seem into it. I guess you could say like, oh, but he was into her anyway. Like he just had to pretend to be buttoned up, but it just didn't read that way for me. It felt weird the way that she was um, objectifying him. She's like, Ooh, I've been touching myself to thoughts of you in your boxer briefs because I walked in on you one time. The audacity to say that to someone that you have never had any sexual contact with, it was just very unwarranted. I did not like it. I felt like the story didn't know what it wanted to be. Like the first half of the story was supposed to be kind of humorous and there were moments that I did laugh. I will I will say that to Megan Quinn's credit, but the last half of the book I think was completely different. It was very hallmarky. It had Lily and Keller kind of like sharing their past traumas. I think they both have like deceased parents or something like that. And so they sort of bonded over that. I'm not saying, again, that's bad but I just it felt weird having this sort of like weird very sexual thing also they have sort of like a weird dom sub relationship where she calls him the king I'm not saying dom sub relationships are weird I'm saying this one was weird that contrasted with the kind of like heartfelt emotional thing that tried to happen at the end of the book you know her meeting her grandparents for the first time it just was fucking it was a fucking weird book not a great book <laughs> club pick and I'm pretty sure I was the one that nominated this one too so I feel a little bit like yikes uh, about it two stars just moving on moving on the next book that I read is a book that you will hear my more in-depth thoughts about in an upcoming reading vlog. I think it's coming on Thursday. It is Everything We Didn't Say by Nicole Bart. This one wasn't very good. <laughs> this is the one book in that vlog that I just really didn't enjoy, and this one follows our main character, Juniper, who has returned to her hometown to help one of her, like, older friends or whatever. She calls her her friend, but it sounded like she was maybe a teacher at one point. I'm not entirely sure. She goes to help this woman who is dying of cancer, unfortunately, um, and she is going to help run the library in her hometown. And Juniper left a long time ago for multiple different reasons, one of which being that her brother was accused of killing 
killing their next door neighbors. And so this story kind of follows the cold case of what happened to those next door neighbors and, you know, um, if Jonathan really did it. I don't know. There was just a lot here that didn't work for me. There was this like subplot, I guess, of reconnection between Juniper and her daughter Willa, who is like 13, I think. I think that Juniper had her at 19, left her with her own parents and um, I guess visits on occasion. It's hard, I guess, to remark on situations like this because I've never been in this situation and I think as long as the child is healthy and taken care of, I can't really complain, but it felt like Juniper was like resentful of the situation and yet she did nothing to better the situation between her and her daughter and her and her family in general. Like I just didn't really understand her motivations. It was, it was weird in that regard. So that was something that like kind of turned me off of the story. And then I also just felt like the mystery thriller aspect of this book was, was severely lacking. It felt like it was trying to be something uh, a little deeper, a little bit more like the good daughter-esque by Karen Slaughter, something that felt a little bit more deeply emotional and it just unfortunately missed the mark. It was a lot of like kind of flashback moments of Juniper and this guy who also was like not accused of killing the neighbors but like could have I guess been a suspect and I think that was supposed to like throw us off the scent of the real killer and it also I guess focused on Juniper's relationships with people but like never went deep enough for you to care or be invested in the story. The mystery thriller aspect too I was just like this is the most basic answer. I called the killer from like the beginning of the book. I, I could definitely figure out who it was pretty pretty easily pretty quickly. I knew the motivation again pretty easily pretty quickly because it wasn't anything interesting or different or even remotely clever which was disappointing because I was like reading and reading and reading I was like okay are we gonna get any clues are we gonna get any hints and then the very end of the book is when we get the reveal and it was just like I waited this long for this it was just not it was not a good time I wouldn't recommend it I give this one two stars okay probably the worst romance that I read this one was a book that I finished <laughs> and it is The Kiss Curse by Aaron Sterling I have officially given up on Aaron Sterling's writing I think I tried the x hacks last year I DNF'd that one I unhauled it I never not never but usually do not DNF books that I own so that was like a really big deal to me at the time but for some reason you know uh it was a book of the month selection I got to pick two books and, and that was one that I picked I was like it's a romance I'm always going to pick like the romance and the thriller selection for the most part from Book of the Month. So I got The Kiss Curse, okay? And it was a mistake. It just was. It was not the worst book I've ever read. I can appreciate the vibes that Aaron Sterling tries to kind of summon up, conjure up in kind of a Halloween town-esque setting. You know, we've got this small town where there is a college that is like part magical school and part just regular college. We've got these little like witchy shops. It's a tourist destination. Like the vibes are right. But the romance is never right. The, the romance has never fucking work. This one is between Gwyn and Wells. Wells is the brother of the hero of the last book, and Gwyn is the cousin of the heroine of the last book. So not only will they be cousins, I guess, but they will also be sisters-in-law, which, okay, interesting. Wells is coming from Wales to this small town, Graves Glen, and he is going to open up his own little witchy shop. It's not going to be a real witchy shop because, you know, you don't want to sell real magical items to tourists, but his is going to have this, like, really cozy, warm vibe to it. It's going to have a fireplace. It's going to just be this place everybody wants to come and people do come there people like really enjoy his shop and it is a direct competitor to Gwen's shop across the way which is a little bit more like focused on like astrology and parties and like more fun side I guess of the supernatural and I guess they end up in some sort of romantic relationship if we're even gonna fucking call it that the issue I had with this book was that there were no meaningful conversations between hero and heroine you have brief and I mean brief interactions in terms of dialogue and then they make out okay and then they have a couple of other conversations and dialogue and then they have sex together and then a couple of other conversations and then they're professing their love to, for each other. When I say conversations, like I said, these are not meaningful conversations that lead the narrative forward that make you feel like these characters should be together. It's it's like a little bit of banter, like, haha, my shop's doing better than yours. Haha, here's a nickname that I have for you. Haha, like, that's it. There's not like, here's my childhood trauma or like, here are some things that are meaningful to me that make me who I am. Like, you need those elements for it to be a successful romance, in my humble opinion. I guess the sex scenes in this book were hot. If that's something you're looking for. Like, I love a guy who enjoys a gal and her nether bits, I guess. Like, I, I I guess, I guess. I just, that's like all I, all the good I can say about this book. Like the vibes were okay. The sex scenes were good. The romance was just severely fucking lacking. Like I just, uh, it irritates me that this book was published because I think if it had been workshopped just a little bit with just literally one or two more scenes of like actual meaningful dialogue and conversation, this could have been successful and probably would have been like a three or maybe even a four star read for me. But as it stands, it's a two. It's just like not good. I'm gonna stop ranting about it, but it just irritates me because it had so much potential. Another book that I think had, I was gonna say had potential. I mean, I think that might be like, 
generous, okay? Rhapsodic by Laura Thalassa. This book is about a siren, Calypso, and in this world, there are supernatural beings with supernatural powers. There's also another universe, I guess, or another world where the fae creatures live, and I guess they're different than humans imbued with magical powers. I'm not really sure, but Calypso, since she was pretty young and murdered her stepfather, she has been in contact with the bargainer, who is a fae from the other world, and in, I guess, the regular world, he, like, bargains with people and gives them what they want for a price, and she has bargained with this man, like, hundreds of times at this point, point. and in the present day, he is finally coming to collect on the bargains that she has made. If you like Akhtar and you want it to be hornier, this is that book. This is literally that. It is definitely a more modern approach to that kind of story, but there is sort of like a fated mates aspect between Calypso and I can't remember the guy's name, so I'm just gonna call him Todd. I will say in comparison to like the Kiss Curse, this one really did focus on the romance like very, very heavily. There are meaningful conversations had. There are reveals. Again, there is that fated mate sort of thing. So I think if you're looking for that, you want something that is just a little bit basic, I guess, because there's not a whole lot of plot. This could work for you. Like it's fun enough, but I did have issues with it. Like it wasn't anything groundbreaking. I wish there had been more plot. There were attempts made at plot that I don't want to spoil, but it just didn't really go anywhere interesting. Granted, it's only the first book in a series, but like still not enough. And my other main issue with the story was that there is a character who I believe is supposed to be black. I don't think it says on page whether or not the character's black, but it's heavily implied. And the use of, I don't even know if it would be considered AAVE, but I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and, and say that. I just feel like white authors in writing black characters shouldn't really be using AAVE because uh, you're not going to do it right. I, I mean, that's just, that's the cold hard facts. Like you're not going to do it right. And so it reads as disingenuous. It reads as like a caricature. It's just not really a good idea. That's not to say that you should not have people of color in your stories. You definitely should. Um, but let's be a little bit wiser about how we're writing our dialogue. All I'm going to say about that, I ended up giving this book like three stars. It was fine. It was like nothing special. I think I'm probably going to unhaul it. Moving on. A book <laughs> that I guess this is the last one that I like actively kind of didn't like. The other books that I'm going to talk about are all like four or five star reads, like fun, fun stuff. Lockdown on Linden Lane by Beth Regals. I read this one for that 36 book video, and this one was just a weird book because it wanted to be a romance so desperately, but I just didn't accomplish it because of the way that the story was laid out. So this one is about a few different couples and their different relationships as a result of um, Miss Roni, shall we say. So all these characters are stuck in individual apartments for a week-long period, and we've got people who like had a one-night stand together that are stuck together for a week. We have people in the beginning of a relationship that are stuck together for a week. We have people in a long-term relationship. We have people who are separated during their long-term relationship. We've got like one person who's stuck in the apartment and one person who's not. They kind of struggle with that. It's a compelling enough idea. I just think that the approach of a romance for the story didn't really work because to have a romance really progress in a week, even if it is lockdown based, it's just not, it's not going to really happen. We have one character who decides, oh, this is the time. Being separated for just a week makes me feel like I need to propose to my, sp to my partner. And I'm not saying that absence doesn't make the hard grow fodder, but it just seemed a little bit like over the top and silly for this one character who separated from his partner for a week to want to propose to her because she's not there. Just none of, the, none of the relationships I think moved forward in a way that really like stuck with me and resonated with me. And I just think it could have been more interesting from a different lens. Like if this had been a literary fiction story, I think it could have been more compelling. It would have to be written completely differently for sure, but I don't think the idea of a lockdown story is necessarily terrible. It just doesn't work as a romance. A story that I thought was actually kind of fun very unhinged, but very fun. You're Invited by Amanda Giatissa. Liked the story a lot. I thought it was a lot of fun. So this story is about our main character, Amaya, and she is invited to her former best friend, Kavindi's wedding. And Kavi is actually getting married to Amaya's ex-boyfriend. So Amaya's like, okay, so I'm not friends with this girl anymore. And now she's dating my ex-boyfriend. I have to go and make sure this wedding doesn't happen. Like this is not happening. And Amaya at the beginning of the story is like a really compelling character because has some stuff going on in her life that's not only interesting, but also leads you to believe she might be a little bit unhinged. So you're wondering if she's going to be a reliable narrator. And at the end of the story, we actually get Kavindi's perspective about kind of everything that's happening. And we also kind of understand that she's a little bit unhinged as well. And in this book, Kavindi actually goes missing. <laughs> and that's sort of the whole crux of the story. It's like, she goes missing before the wedding happens. Did Amaya have something to do with it? Like who wanted it out for her? Like what's, what's going on? Is she dead? Is she alive? Who knows? The ending of this book, I will say the last 50 pages of the story are absolutely insane. Some of the most twisty, dramatic, like fun stuff I have ever read. But I think my issue with this book was again, it was one of the stories that didn't really know what it wanted to be. I couldn't tell if this was going to be kind of gone girl, kind of psychological based on the description of Maya at the beginning, or if it was going to be something that is just like kind of purely domestic um, or felt something a little bit more akin to, uh, was it The Guest List by Lucy Foley? I think the, the fact that the first half of the story and the second half of the story were so disparate, it kind of made for a weird reading experience. I think had the author kind of decided from the beginning, like what direction she wanted to go, it would have been 
more interesting but I also couldn't bring myself to dislike it because the twists were so fun and were not things that I necessarily saw coming definitely dark definitely dark stuff and also just kind of like juicy and I don't know I did like the kind of family drama aspect of the story as well so I gave this book three stars I'd be so interested to read more from this author in the future also like reading her description on like the back flap of the book she seems like a fucking cool person she owns a chain of cookie shops she has a couple of huskies she I don't know she just seems like a cool fucking person so like bad respect to her for also finding the time to write a thriller anyway three stars moving on i read it's in his kiss by julia quinn this is a book that i picked up definitely on a whim probably didn't need to pick this book up given the amount of historical romances on my physical tbr but you know what i was feeling it i wanted to read the last couple of books in the series just to say that i have i guess and there's just something about is it rosalind lindor the narrator for the series she just she kills it every time she just makes it an enjoyable listening experience and i don't know i was on the road i wanted something to listen to so i picked this up this is the seventh book in the bridgerton series it is hyacinth's story and she ends up with a guy named Garrett. Hyacinth and Gareth, which actually I think is sort of a um, a joke, like a lisp joke in the story. But anyway, I thought this one was very original in comparison to a lot of the other Bridgerton books. Hyacinth at the beginning of the story is someone who's very argumentative, but not in a particularly bold way. She is distinctive, I would say, from Eloise in that she doesn't make any super rash decisions. But she is someone who has a quick wit and isn't willing to settle for a guy who doesn't also have um, the same kind of wit that she does. And so it's been challenging for her to find someone who really fits the bill. Something that I personally could really relate to as well was that she was someone who doesn't like to be embarrassed and she's someone who doesn't like to be bad at things so if she thinks that either of those things is going to happen she avoids the situation altogether so very relatable i think for a lot of people but especially for me and so i really felt sympathetic towards her character and then in walks gareth who is the grandson of lady danbury he has kind of an interesting past because his father told him at kind of a young age hey i don't love you uh, i don't even like you i just tolerate your presence you are a mischief maker and you're also not actually my son so you need to behave if you want to inherit any money or get any sort of allowance and he becomes estranged from his father at a pretty young age as well this story is about hyacinth and gareth obviously like falling in love together but also gareth obtains this journal from i believe it's either his grandmother or his mother's journal and he's hoping to kind of maybe find out a little bit about his parentage there's also a mystery that unfolds in the journal as well about diamonds that are hidden somewhere in the family home and so he enlists the help of hyacinth who translates the italian and they kind of you know embark on this journey together and it was just fun it was a fun little adventure i did feel like these two characters were really well suited together it was just fun reading about them my issue with julia quinn's writing typically is that i don't think her romances are the best developed i think she does really well with side characters i think that the atmosphere is fun the dialogue is always really convincing and just interesting but i think uh her romances just aren't aren't perfect for me they're not the most swoony they're not the most puzzle pc and that was definitely the case here that's why this is like a three and a half maybe a four star read rather than a five star but um it's just a fun one i definitely think this is one of the better books in the series and i am kind of curious to read the last book in the series now as a result i'll hopefully be picking that up sometime in december kind of around the Christmas season. Just something about a historical romance just really gives me like Christmassy vibes, but this was a really fun one and I am very glad that I read it, even though I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> Moving on to a four star and a five star read. Signed here by Claudia Lux. This is a debut novel and I think it's supposed to be somewhere between like a horror and a thriller. This story is about our main character, Peyote Trip, who works on the, I believe, fifth floor of hell and that is like the second highest level. He has worked his way up and he is trying to get the ultimate promotion and the way to do that is to make a deal with a complete set. A complete set is basically a certain amount of family members, a certain pro proportion of family members, making a deal with him that they will sell their soul for whatever, you know, their heart desires. And uh, he has his eye on one particular family that he has been keeping close eyes on, that he has collected so many deals from over the past, and he needs one more deal to complete the set. So we follow Peyote as he's trying to make this deal to, you know, rise up in the ranks also his interesting relationship with a new person who is also working in hell with him and then we also again follow uh the family that he is kind of watching and trying to see which of the members is going to like make that ultimate deal and i thought it was fascinating i really liked the scenes in hell with peyote and cal uh, or calamity as she is known their relationship and the dynamic there is very interesting and changing all the time and then also the family dynamic is really interesting because there's sort of a murder mystery component to the stuff that's happening on earth uh we have uh, a family and the father brother murdered a girl 
and they're all going back to the scene of the crime essentially the like family lake house for a summer and they're bringing a new person with them not just their children but also a friend of their kid named ruth and she kind of stirs up some drama and makes things interesting i thought this book was really interesting and i think this is a book that would do well with a reread i think it is trying to say something a little bit about death and morality and the choices that we make for the people that we love but it was also just compelling as a story in general with the idea of hell and like what that actually looks like i liked the way that it was conceptualized in this book and i also just liked the mystery thriller aspect. I thought it was fun and juicy and maybe a touch predictable, but just just interesting overall to read. I had a good time with this book and it's kind of crazy to me that this is a debut because it was that impressive. I really liked this book and I would highly recommend it. I'll give you my more in-depth thoughts and feelings again in that vlog that's coming on Thursday, but I, I really like this book. And then the last book that I read this month, not actually the last book that I read, but the last book that I have to talk to you about is A Photo Finish by Elsie Silver. I think I've talked about this book in passing in other videos, but I don't think I vlogged this book at all. I think I pretty much kept this one to myself and just had a good time with it and it was quite, quite the decision because it was five stars. It's fucking awesome. So this book follows our two main characters, Cole and Violet, I believe. Violet, our heroine, is an up-and-coming jockey, and she is super talented, definitely an up-and-coming star, but she unfortunately is injured very early on in the book, and because of her leg injury, she is unable to climb the stairs of her loft apartment and is forced to stay with Cole, who is back at his family's ranch, for reasons that I honestly cannot remember, but he is there, and so Violet is having to stay with Cole. Cole is a very uh, interesting hero. He is near and dear to my heart. I think he was in the military at one point, but he is someone who is really stoic. He has a lot of emotions that he keeps to himself, and he has a really hard time being vulnerable with his brother and with the people around him, but he eventually obviously becomes vulnerable with Violet. This is such a delightful, I would say mutual pining story between two characters who definitely have baggage and who definitely have pasts. It was steamy. It was well-written. I feel like the dialogue, the interpersonal um, conflict and relationship development. It was just there. It was there. It was so hot and so fun. And this is a book that I feel like comes highly recommended from this author, and I totally understand why. I think this is her best book to date, although I did really like Heartless, which I also read this month. I read that one for my KU blog that I posted most recently. I had two five-star reads in that video, so go watch that if you haven't seen it already. This one I think is is like her ultimate like best book that she's written. I think if you are a fan of Mariana Zapata or anyone who writes like those really gruff, really grumpy heroes who's kind of like only nice to the heroine, I think you would really, really like this book. It's not overly long. It does have enough of a slow burn, I think, to be convincing. If you're someone who really hates Instalove, I don't think you'll have an issue with this one. I feel like now that I'm trying to describe this book and describe what I love about it, I'm not able to really like conjure the words and summon those feelings again. But I will say this is just one of those books that I love and I instantly added to my wish list. I've been slowly building myself a wish list for next year. I have not purchased really any books in 2022 and I'm going to do a whole video on that at some point. But for 2023, I have a growing Amazon wish list of like indies that I want in paperback and this one like automatically went to that list. I think it went to that list even before I finished it because it was just that good. Five stars, like so much fun. Highly recommend if you need a good romance, just pick it up. Um, it is in a small town setting. It is uh, a ranch story, I guess, with a, a whole cast of side characters that are really fun as well. So would recommend. It's great for the fall time. Anyway, those are 11, I think, of the 28 books that I read or attempted to read <laughs> this month. I, like I said, had a really good reading month. It was obviously a mixed bag like it is every month, but I do feel like I had a higher proportion of four and five star reads this month, a lot of which I didn't talk about in this video. Um, most of those are like in my KU vlogs. I feel like in general, this reading year is shaping up to be something that I'm actually really happy with. At kind of the midway point in July, I was really worried that I wouldn't have like any five-star romances. I think I had like one or two. And at this point, the list of five-star romances has grown so much. Just in general, my list of five stars has grown. I've read some really good high fantasy. I'll try to link to that in the description if you want to go and watch that video where I read five of my longest books, some of which were high fantasy, one of which was The Way of Kings, which is a five-star read for me. Like this year is shaping up to be something that I um, uh, really, really liked and really enjoyed, and I'm looking back on it already with fond memories, so um, that's a good thing, because in other aspects of my life, it's been a shit year. Reading has been pretty decent, though, and I'm, I'm happy about it. Looking forward to November and December, I feel like I always kind of, like, end these wrap-ups off with, like, a little bit of a hint of what's to come. November, December, I have my schedule locked and loaded. You're gonna have so many fun secret TBR videos. Next Sunday, you can expect a Choose Your Own Adventure video from me, where I'm gonna read 12 mystery thrillers. Very excited to share that with you here, and then I have a lot 
lot of, you know, fun romance content. The end of the year obviously brings those end of year videos, best, worst, disappointing, but also things like my Goodreads Choice Word video and um, just other, other fun and exciting stuff. The last video I'm posting in December, I'm really hyped about too. And I think, I think you guys will be as well, but um, just in general, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching this wrap up. Thank you for uh, your support in general this year. It has been really overwhelming the amount of love y'all have shown me, um, you know, with our things that have happened and also with all of the good things that have happened this year. So just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you. I think I said thank you in my last wrap up as well, but um, I just don't ever want to take for granted the amount of love and support that y'all show me. So thanks so much for watching this video. I love y'all so much and until next time.